the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the federal government writ large in the first seven decades of the 20th century invested billions of dollars in racial segregation and concentrated poverty. Each time this country created a peculiar institution that subordinated Black people, slavery, Jim Crow, it created and dismantled it. They replaced it with another one. And the iconic Black ghetto, I don't use that as a purgative, I use it as a descriptor, was a follow-on institution to slavery and Jim Crow. That's the legacy that every new administration inherits and the Biden administration has as well. In my campaign for president, I made it very clear that the moment it arrived as a nation where we face deep racial inequities in America and system, systemic racism that has plagued our nation for far, far too long. I said that over the course of the past year that the blinders have been taken off the nation, the American people. What, Mar what many Americans didn't see or had simply refused to see couldn't be ignored any longer. It's been proven, sadly, that the modern phenomenon of concentrated black poverty was an intentional government-sponsored institution. This is in part why President Joe Biden issued an executive order in January 2021 intended to right the historical wrongs the preponderant black communities have been facing when it comes to housing and home ownership in the United States. Today, I'm directing the Department of Housing and Urban Affairs and Urban Development to redress the historical racism in federal housing policies. In the 1960s, many believed that the civil rights movement's successes would foster a new era of racial equality in America. Four decades later, the degree of racial inequality has barely changed. To understand what went wrong, we have to understand what has happened to African American communities over the last several decades. In his book, Stuck in Place, Patrick Sharkey, professor and chair of the Department of Sociology at New York University, who also happens to be scientific director at Crime Lab New York, describes how political decisions and social policies have led to severe disinvestment from black neighborhoods, persistent segregation, declining economic opportunities, and a growing link between African-American communities and the criminal justice system. As a result, neighborhood inequality that existed in the 1970s has been passed down to the current generation of African Americans. Some of the most persistent forms of racial inequality, such as gaps in income and test scores, can only be explained by considering the neighborhoods in which black and white families have lived over multiple generations. This multi-generational nature of neighborhood inequality also means that a new kind of urban policy is necessary for our nation's cities. Such urban policies, Sharkey argues, that have the potential to create transformative and sustained changes in urban communities and the families that live within them. In this video today, we are taking a solemn dive at the structural racism and segregation long going on in America, exposing the concentrated poverty, unduly nagging at the black communities therein. This sad state is said to have been a deliberate governmental design, which can be well spotted while looking at the history of housing in the United States. Before we continue, do support our works by hitting that like button in front of you. Share with families and friends to keep spreading our eye-opening black narrative and kindly subscribe to stay on for more, while you also help in building the rising membership of this channel. We appreciate your support. Now let us get back in. Because of racial segregation, a significant share of black America has been condemned to experience a social environment where poverty and joblessness are the norm, where a majority of children are born out of wedlock, where most families are on welfare, where educational failure prevails, and where social and physical deterioration abound. Through prolonged exposure to such an environment, black chances for social and economic success are drastically reduced. Such are the words of Douglas Massey and Nancy Denton in American Apartheid. Over the past three years, President Biden and Vice President Harris, having acknowledged the nagging upsets in the black communities for as long as anyone can remember, is said to have leveraged the full force of the federal government to advance racial justice and equity and ensure the promise of America for all communities, including black Americans across the country. COVID-19 has further ripped a 
a path of destruction through every community in America, but no one has been spared, but the devastation in communities of color has been nothing short of stunning. Just look at the numbers. 40% of frontline workers, nurses, first responders, grocery store workers, are Americans of color, and many are still living on the edge. One in 10 black Americans is out of work today. One in 11 Latino Americans is out of work today. One in seven households in America, about one in four black, one in five Latino households in America, report that they don't have enough food to eat in the United States of America. Black and Latino Americans are dying of COVID-19 at rates nearly three times that of white Americans. And it's not white Americans' fault, but just a fact. And the Americans now know it, especially younger Americans. And they are pulling us toward justice in so many ways, forcing us to confront the huge gap in economic, excuse me, economic inequity between those at the top and everyone else, forcing us to confront the existential crisis of climate, and yes, forcing us to confront systemic racism and white supremacy. From promoting entrepreneurship to increasing access to home ownership and delivering the lowest black unemployment rate, from proving it's possible to reduce child poverty to historic lows to expanding access to quality affordable health care, from advancing voting rights and police accountability to ensuring equal access to a high quality education with historic funding for historically black colleges and universities, HBC Us. President Biden and Vice President Harris are said to be committed to investing in the future of black communities. It is said that, with support of these efforts, black Americans are starting new businesses, creating jobs, buying homes, and taking advantage of increased education opportunities at historic rates, contributing to a 60% increase in wealth compared to before the pandemic. Let's take a moment to see how the state of things has been for a very long time now. Before we get into this BS policy called redlining that created housing segregation and pretty much jacked up the American dream for black folks, let's take it back to the 1930s. America is in the thick of the Great Depression and y'all, it was bad. Around one fifth of the country was unemployed and nearly everyone was dirt poor. Along comes FDR with his New Deal. Dude was trying to revitalize the American economy, which created what we now call the middle class. But not so fast. FDR's New Deal would cement racial inequality in America for generations to come and birth two programs that enforced housing segregation, the Public Works Administration and the Homeowners Loan Corporation, known today as the Federal Housing Administration. The PWA created affordable housing, and surprise, surprise, the agency created separate public housing for black and white folks, greatly segregating cities. Now let's talk about the Federal Housing Administration. The FHA created low interest mortgages to build homes across the country. This agency actually built the suburbs as we know it. They basically said, hey banks, if someone applies for a mortgage, go ahead, build them a house. Even if they don't pay you back, we'll still guarantee a loan unless they're black. The FHA's manual literally prohibited the occupancy of properties except by the race for which they are intended. But before we go any further, let me call on a friend to break down the legacy of redlining. The world-renowned white peopleologist from the roots, Michael Harriet. How are these racist-ass racist government policies tie into what we now call redlining? The term came about because the federal government, Uncle Sam Nip, created color-coded maps that told banks where they could give out housing loans. The green sections were a go, whereas the red sections, typically where black people lived, were deemed too risky. Even well-off black neighborhoods like Sugar Hill in Harlem, where black people like Zora Neale Hurston and Duke Ellington lived, were off limits to banks. Aside from financial barriers, there were actual physical barriers to prevent black people from living in white neighborhoods. In the early 1940s, there was a six foot high wall in Detroit because redlining, and it's still there today. The Fair Housing Act put an end to redlining in 1968, but we know it ain't go down like that. Banks across the country have been caught using redlining maps as recently as 2015. And get this, most redlined areas are still low-income black and brown neighborhoods. William Julius Wilson was among the first to realize that poverty had become geographically concentrated in large American cities during the 1970s, 
In his book, The Truly Disadvantaged, 1987, the number of people living in poverty areas, defined as census tracts with poverty rates of at least 20%, rose by 40% in the five largest U.S. cities, 1970 and 1980. Over the same period, the number of people living in high poverty areas, those with poverty rates of at least 40%, grew by 69%. These trends occurred not only because poverty increased in areas that were already poor, but also because poor areas grew in number. In Chicago, for example, Wilson counted 16 poor community areas in 1970, but counted 26 in 1980. Over the same period, the number of high poverty areas increased from 1 to 9. Subsequent studies have generally confirmed Wilson's observations. The dawn of the 20th century, African Americans in major cities lived scattered throughout the city. They weren't segregated particularly. It's only with the great migration of six to seven million African Americans north and west escaping the south. The predominant response of the United States government and state and local governments to the Great Migration was to contain Black people in their own neighborhoods. The Great Migration was one of the largest movements of people in United States history. Approximately six million Black people moved from the American South to Northern, Midwestern, and Western states, roughly from the 1910s until the 1970s. The driving force behind the mass movement was to escape racial violence, pursue economic and educational opportunities, and obtain freedom from the oppression of Jim Crow. The Great Migration is often broken into two phases, coinciding with the participation and effects of the United States in both world wars. The First Great Migration, 1910 to 1940, had black Southerners relocate to northern and midwestern cities including New York, Chicago, Detroit, and Pittsburgh. When the war effort ramped up in 1917, more able-bodied men were sent off to Europe to fight, leaving their industrial jobs vacant. The labor supply was further strained with a decline in immigration from Europe and standing bans on peoples of color from other parts of the world. All of this afforded the opportunity for the black population to be the labor supply in non-agricultural industries. And HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, was particularly a part of this role. But the precursors to HUD introduced and encouraged racially restrictive covenants, redlining of every major city where African Americans landed. The federal government was a sponsor of urban renewal, infamously called Negro removal by the great James Baldwin. Although the migrants found better jobs and fled the South entrenched in Jim Crow, many African Americans faced injustices and difficulties after migrating. The Red Summer of 1919 was rooted in tensions and prejudice that arose from white people having to adjust to the demographic changes in their local communities. From World War I until World War II, it is estimated that about 2 million black people left the South for other parts of the country. World War II brought an expansion to the nation's defense industry and many more jobs for African Americans in other locales, again encouraging a massive migration that was active until the 1970s. During this period, more people moved north and further west to California's major cities, including Oakland, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, as well as Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington. Within 20 years of World War II, a further 3 million black people migrated throughout the United States. Black people who migrated during the second phase of the Great Migration were met with housing discrimination as localities had started to implement restrictive covenants and redlining, which created segregated neighborhoods but also served as a foundation for the existing racial disparities in wealth in the United States. Over the past 40 years, the country has experienced sharp increases in urban poverty. The number of metropolitan neighborhoods in which 30% or more of residents live in poverty doubled between 1980 and 2010. Moreover, almost two-thirds of the high-poverty neighborhoods in 1980 were still very poor almost 40 years later. According to Jargowski and Bain, 1991, the number of poor people living in census tracts with poverty rates of over 40% increased by 30% during the 1970s. Studies by Hughes, 1989, and Weicher, 1990, also revealed sharp increases in the number of poor census tracts over the decades, 
Although comparable analyses have not been done using the 1990 census, work by Nathan and Adams 1989, have suggested that the trend towards more concentrated poverty has continued during the 1980s. Between 1980 and 1986, the percentage of poor people living in poor neighborhoods grew from 40% to 57%. Being born and raised in grinding, persistent poverty damages children's long-term outcomes. Moreover, when families live for long periods in such conditions, it is not only deleterious to the family, but the impact on the family differs significantly by race. As Sharkey notes, black Americans are far more likely than whites to be stuck in place. He found that two-thirds of black Americans brought up in the poorest neighborhoods remain in the poorest quarter of neighborhoods after a generation. Meanwhile, only 40% of whites brought up in the poorest neighborhoods remain there. The long-term effects of being born and raised in a high-poverty neighborhood are thus far more persistent and damaging for blacks than for whites. The proportion of blacks encountering that pattern is also greater than for other groups. Today, one in four black Americans are stuck in high poverty neighborhoods, compared with one in six Hispanics and just one in 13 white Americans, according to a report by Paul A. Jargowski for the New Century Foundation. Adding to the generational barriers facing young black Americans, a 2018 study by Chetty finds that, after controlling for parental income, Black boys have lower incomes in adulthood than white boys in 99% of census tracts. The vast majority of black American families currently living in poor neighborhoods have lived in similarly poor neighborhoods for multiple generations, Sharkey said. This is part of their family history to live in a disadvantaged environment. In the 70s, we had a clinic, recreation center, YMCA, Salvation Army, grocery store, and a small library right in the community. Those were good times, even though we were poor. By the mid-80s, all those facilities were gone and replaced with a police station and crack, says Mrs. Kim, an online YouTuber. Sharkey presented that even African-American families who were doing fairly well a generation ago have experienced extremely high rates of downward mobility. More than half of black children raised in middle-class families moved downward in the income distribution when they reached adulthood. The persistence of income inequality comes down to the different environments in which people are raised. More than half, 52%, of African-American families live in high-poverty neighborhoods over consecutive generations, compared to 7% of whites. Black families making $100,000 a year or more live in more disadvantaged neighborhoods than whites making less than $30,000. Just this figure alone tells you that something is going on in American neighborhoods that is not driven by income, not driven by wealth, but is unique to this interaction between race and urban inequality. Sharke further puts out, The basic pattern here is very clear. Black and white children continue to live in entirely different social worlds. Living in poorer neighborhoods during childhood increases the probability of downward mobility by about half. Black and white families that look very similar in terms of economic profile diverge because the black families are much more likely to live in a disadvantaged environment that has lower quality institutions, most notably schools and social support organizations. With neighborhood inequality having persisted over time and affecting the trajectories of families for multiple generations, Sharkey argues that urban policy needs be made more durable. We have to think about policies that are more than short-term initiatives that provide influxes of resources into a community for a few years. Sharkey passionately points out, we need to think about housing mobility programs that do more than provide a short-term excursion out of a poor neighborhood, but really create sustained changes in the type of environment where families live and more transformative opportunities for families in their new environments. Sharkey contends that the reason there has not been sustained investment in low-income areas of color is because federal urban policy is based on a narrative linking central cities with race and violent crime, creating a policy agenda focused on abandonment and punishment. This growth in concentrated urban poverty has been more pronounced for certain groups and regions than others. According to Massey and Eggers, 1990, urban poverty was most concentrated among African Americans and Puerto Ricans, and the sharpest increases were observed in the Northeast and Midwest. Jargowski and Bain, in 1991, found that just 10 metropolitan areas contained most of the nation's ghetto poor, New York, Chicago, Newark, Philadelphia, Detroit, Columbus, 
Atlanta, Baltimore, Buffalo, and Patterson, NJ. Ghetto poor were defined as people living in neighborhoods where the poverty rate exceeded 40%. Likewise, Hughes, 1989 to 1990, identified six urban areas with the largest number of impacted ghetto areas, Detroit, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Chicago, Cleveland, and Washington. A key argument of Massey and Denton's American Apartheid, 1993, is that racial residential segregation and non-white group poverty rates combine interactively to produce spatially concentrated poverty. Despite a compelling theoretical rationale, the empirical tests of this proposition have been negative or mixed. This paper develops a formal decomposition model that expands the Massey model of how segregation, group poverty rates, and other spatial conditions combine to form concentrated poverty. The revised decomposition model allows for income effects on cross-race neighborhood residents and interactive combinations of multiple spatial conditions in the formation of concentrated poverty. Applying the model to data reveals that racial segregation and income segregation within race contribute importantly to poverty concentration, as Massey argued, but that almost equally important for poverty concentration is the disproportionate poverty of the non-group neighbors of blacks and Hispanics. However, a notable difference in the typical lives of whites, blacks, Hispanics, and Asians in the United States is the economic class of persons in their social environments. White middle-class families overwhelmingly live in middle-class neighborhoods and send their children to middle-class schools. But many black and Hispanic middle-class parents live in working-class or poor neighborhoods and send their children to high-poverty schools. About one in three poor white families live in poor neighborhoods and send their children to high-poverty schools, compared to two in three poor black and Hispanic families. Much evidence indicates that the socioeconomic levels of residential neighborhoods and schools affect quality of life and life chances. Concentrated disadvantage in neighborhoods is one of the most durable predictors of high rates of violent crime, and differences in neighborhood disadvantage explains much of the racial gap in exposure to violence, in the words of Peterson and Crivo, 2005. Sampson and Wilson, in 1995, argue that high poverty environments are criminogenic, encouraging youth to pursue criminal rather than legitimate careers. The spatial separation of the affluent and poor produces spatial mismatch between the demand for job and job seekers, contributing to high unemployment in poorer neighborhoods. Likewise, high poverty schools tend to be ineffective educationally and have disproportionately high dropout rates. Racial gaps in the affluence of neighborhood and school environments contribute importantly to persistent racial inequalities. In Buffalo, many years ago, they closed many libraries in the city, many in the poor parts of town. It was horrendous. The children especially needed them, I believe. I, myself, miss them. They took them away from people so that a lot of them, I'm sure, made it hard for them to get to other libraries. It's indeed very nice when people can actually walk to the library in their own neighborhood and then, two, the afternoon activities for the children and such. I'm crying, says Angela Eisenhardt. And here goes again, Mrs. Kim. My three sons benefited from those afternoon programs and field trips, summer camps, summer jobs, and especially what being in a community felt like, where unlike the stereotypes, the majority of parents had jobs. It takes a village. The drugs and defunding tore all that apart and forced us out into a world of unfair employment and loan practices, unequal wages, enormous school and medical costs, not to mention the racists who didn't want us in their neighborhoods, which is why I came back to the hood after my sons became awesome adults. The late 2000s Great Recession brought rising neighborhood poverty in the midst of affluence and the re-emergence of a racial and ethnic underclass living in inner-city neighborhoods. Approach redirects attention to a level of geography, cities, suburbs, and small rural towns, where local political and economic decisions effectively exclude the poor and minority populations. It uses newly released poverty data from the years 2005 to 2009 American Community Survey to provide evidence of changing macro patterns of spatially concentrated poverty. We show that roughly one in four U.S. places had poverty rates exceeding 20% in the year 2005 through 2009, up 31% since 2000. 
Roughly 30% of America's poor reside in poor places, and concentrated poverty is especially high among poor African Americans. Overall, increases in place-based poverty nonetheless were muted over the decade by declines in concentrated poverty among poor Hispanics, a pattern that reflects spatial diffusion to new destinations. America's poor were sorted unevenly from place to place within local labor markets, that is, counties. Poor, non-poor segregation rates between places increased from 12.6 to 18.4 between 1990 and the 2005 to 2009 period. Segregation was especially high among disadvantaged blacks and Hispanics. In their seminal book, American Apartheid, Douglas Massey and Nancy Denton argue that the concentration of poverty in black and Latino neighborhoods is the most pernicious consequence of contemporary racial residential segregation. In their account, the concentration of poverty in minority communities is the result of the combination of high levels of racial segregation with racial gaps in poverty rates, combined with segregation on the basis of poverty status within race. They develop their argument through a series of simulation models and confirm it through an empirical analysis of segregation, group poverty rates, and poverty concentration in American cities. At the center of this debate is Massey's 1990 core point that segregation and minority poverty rates interact or intensify in combination to produce concentrated poverty. Massey's theory emphasized two forms of segregation, racial segregation and poverty status, segregation within race, as key causes of poverty concentration. The decomposition model developed here reveals that to better account for concentrated poverty, we must include a third form of segregation, the segregation of high and medium income members of other groups from blacks and Hispanics. The non-group neighbors of blacks and Hispanics are disproportionately impoverished, a factor that contributes to these groups' high contact with neighborhood poverty. In closing, in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Let us bend that arc with our actions, our voices, and our unwavering commitment to creating a more just and equitable America. Because while the road ahead is long, dismantling structural racism and segregation requires our collective action. Let us, therefore, commit to building a future where opportunities and dignity are not determined by the color of our skin, but by the strength of our resolve and the power of our unity. However, that brings us to the end of this video. Hope you learned a thing or two from it. Do not forget to support our works by hitting that like button in front of you, share with your families and friends to keep spreading our eye-opening black narrative, and kindly subscribe to help in building the rising membership of this channel. Your support means a great deal to our endeavors. Thank you for watching.